if you have me in Sunday school this morning. So we're going to tell a uh, message. We're going to give him a message, aren't we? Yes? We're not going to give him a message? We're not going to give you a message, but Lainey's going to give you one. And when we give this message, you look sad. Yes. <laughs> All right. We're going to do it. We're not going to do it with any music, so we're just going to say the message, aren't we? Yes? Are we going to stay at where everybody can hear us? Yes. And see that man back, way back there in the back? Yeah. <laughs> he can't hear very good. So you got to say it nice and loud, okay? Yeah. Are you ready? Let's see your hands like this. Ready? Nice and loud, really. Ready? Good morning, y'all stand. Days of the Seat. Come on up, Melvin. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
got Tim a shirt, Brother Tim a shirt this last week. They, everybody said I should have got you one. You know what it said? It said, I want to be so filled with Christ that when a mosquito bites me, it says there's power in the blood. <laughs> that, that is real funny, though, because that day when I was back there bleeding, y'all was singing that song, Washed in the Blood, <laughs> and it was all over me for sure. <laughs> Welcome to Merritt Baptist Church, TV land also. You know, the other day I actually watched one of the uh, episodes of it, and I've never heard myself on like this, and I said, I thought I was a part of Hee Haw. I sounded such like a country <laughs> hit. I've never thought I sounded that country before at all. Man. That kind of goes with merit. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was born and raised in Dallas in Oak Cliff. I was a city boy, but turned me uh, to an old country hit when I moved out here. Amen. This one's Proverbs 16, 24. Kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul, and good for your body. You know, what makes honey pure? Bees. The bees. Just pure honey. Just pure honey makes it pure. No additives. Nothing like that adds to it. What makes worship pure? From the heart. Just worship. We don't need a great big church to worship the Lord. That's right. We don't need a great big giant choir. We don't need bells and whistles to worship the Lord. All we need is our heart and our love that we give to such a loving God to have worship. Thank you, guys. I'm going to let him pray today. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just pray this morning that you're with us as we lift our voices to you to sing the praises. Lord, for you alone are worthy of our praise. Lord, we ask these things in your precious Son's holy name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and greet. Stand up.
time, my one defense. You're my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need the 
cost of the oil in my alabaster box. Well, good morning. I uh, am certainly uh, grateful for the fact that uh, y'all have uh, stuck with me through this uh, so far, uh, through the Sermon on the Mount. We are finishing up the Beatitudes. There's eight of those today. And, and again, as we look at these Beatitudes, they are uh, we are to realize that uh, this is not expressing uh, something uh, of where we necessarily are, but it's kind of the goal of where the Holy Spirit uh, is working in us to make us more Christ-like. And uh, we're not going to go around and find someone who is poor in spirit, and then another person who uh, mourns, and then another person who is meek, and uh, another person who hungers and thirsts after righteousness and all that. All these eight Beatitudes are something that the Holy Spirit is working within us. They're all eight characteristics that the Holy Spirit is developing in each and every one of us as followers of Christ. So we come to this last one, and uh, it's it's a, to me, it's a very revealing and uh, eye-opening uh, at you know, characteristic that comes as we grow in those previous seven characteristics. The more that we grow in these previous sevens, the more that this eighth one uh, will appear in our lives. Uh, so, um, you know, this uh, as, as you know, I've, I've been kind of preparing and, and looking over these for a while now. And it was kind of funny because uh, yesterday we had, we finally got to have the Miller Christmas. That's my wife's side of the family. And uh, we were able to have, uh, we, you know, we either have, we have non-traditional holiday food and uh, we either, we normally have chili, but uh, yesterday we decided to do a kind of a Tex-Mex spread, and, uh, you know, so we had tacos and nachos and all of those kind of good foods that are really good and healthy for you, uh, you know, so that uh, we could sit around and enjoy each other's time, you know, and all of that. And towards the end of the evening, most everybody had left. There was just a handful of us, full of us uh, still there, and we kind of got into a discussion about uh, and I will say it was a particular celebrity. I'm not going to name that celebrity, but how the celebrity was being attacked from other by other celebrities, and you know, just kind of the whole uh, thing that that happens, and then that kind of created uh, or evolved into a discussion of, you know, why are women looked at one way versus men looked at another way. And this is uh, directly related to morality, right? Why is an immoral, an immoral woman looked uh, at more negatively than an immoral man? And so we were having this discussion and um, some of my grandkids were there and and as we were discussing this, you know, because they were asking the question, or this one uh, was asking the question, and we, we had to stop and say, listen, we're talking in the way the world views things. You know, the way God, and, and I'm just going to use this as an example to, to get us into uh, this eighth beatitude, the way God sees morality and, you know, sexual purity is quite different than the way the world does. You know, God wants both 
the man and the woman to be pure. And God actually puts a man at a higher level of accountability than in, in, in uh, many cases than he does the woman. Uh, we we know that in you know when we think back uh, at being younger, um, you know you go uh, on a date and it's usually the guy that is trying to persuade the woman. Uh, and and the Bible actually uh, discusses that in very negative terms. Um, and and that. Uh, approach to that, it sees uh, that person who is trying to entice the other person as someone who is uh, almost extorting them or who is, uh, you know, if you would, seduce uh, in a very negative sense. So, so even then, realizing it's usually the guy trying to do that with the girl, there is a an even deeper responsibility, a deeper sin that goes into that, and it's not just the two being immoral, it's the fact that one is trying to uh, seduce the other one, and there's that sin of seduction that goes in there. And and that in the Bible, it, it says, you know, it talks about the adulterous woman, but it talks about the man as a fool. Now, in our modern day and time, you know, for us to consider uh, the word full, we don't, you know, it's just another word, right? I mean, you could call someone, you know, we we even do it, you know, in a, in a way of a greeting, right? It's, you know, hey, full, what's going on? You know, we don't look at it really as a deep uh, criticism um, and and but that's exactly what happens in Proverbs. It's when when God calls the man uh, a fool. It is a very deep, deep insult towards men. And so there is a different standard for people. And and yet the world has their standard, but that standard usually stands in contrast to the biblical standard. And and as we get into this uh, beatitude, and and I want to encourage you to turn to Matthew chapter five, and we're going to read verses ten through twelve. Um, and I'm going to ask you to stand in in honor of reading God's word. Uh, we're going to see and, and we're going to discuss. Uh, this verse. So uh, if you will join me in that, um, we read beginning in verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let us pray. Father, I want to thank you so much for the fact that as you look upon us and, and encourage us to live for you and to identify in our uh, lifestyles and in our actions and our speech, uh, to you that, Lord, we realize that we are separating ourselves from the world and, and standing in conflict and contrast to the world. And, and as such, uh, they see us as different and, and oftentimes they persecute us for that. But you, you look upon us and you are filled with joy and you are congratulatory towards us for setting ourselves apart to you so that we would stand in contrast to a broken world. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Y'all may be seated. So what this is talking about is persecution, and it says, for righteousness' sake. So it's not persecution because 
people are making fun of me because I made a bad financial deal. It's not persecution because people are making fun of me because I went out and got drunk and got sick all, 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 you know, all night long. It's not persecution because of me doing something wrong. It's persecution because I'm trying to live a life that identifies with Jesus Christ. You see, when we were in the world, we were of the world. But as we became saved, we are to separate ourselves. And instead of identifying in our lifestyle and having a lifestyle that identifies as uh, in the world, we have righteousness as a lifestyle, which is a lifestyle that identifies with Christ. I want to I want to read something for you out of First Peter uh, chapter four and verse three. First Peter four three reads it says, "For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties." and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil against you. So in our, for those of us who were converted as adults, there is that lifestyle of wickedness and evil that, that we can identify with, that we lived prior to becoming Christians. And we and and when we became Christians, we separated ourselves from that group of friends who are still living that lifestyle, and and we began to live a life, uh, a righteous lifestyle that identifies with Jesus Christ. And in so doing, right, they see a difference. When you're when you're living for Christ. And people know it when you walk into a room, you're bringing the presence of the Holy Spirit in there with you, and they feel that because of their own sin. They're convicted by your very presence. And if you notice that when you come around them, what do they try to do? They try to entice you and seduce you into the wickedness again. And and as they and as you stand and say, no, that's not the lifestyle that I live anymore. I'm living for Christ. Then that becomes a conviction on them, and it stands as a testimony on them. That's exactly what Paul says in Philippians one and twenty seven and following. He says, hey, I want to come to you. In those previous verses, I want to come to you. But hey, if I can't make it. I want you to remember to live a life worthy of the gospel. And he says, he's basically telling them, hey, don't just live that way when I'm around, but you learn to stand on your own two feet in Christ because when you do that, it's a living testimony that stands against those who oppose Christ. And and how did the people treat the world? Or how did the world treat Jesus? They nailed him to a cross. Jesus said, Hey, if they if they're going to do this to me, don't think you're going to get treated any better. So so you probably have experienced if you were a, an adult or came to Christ as an adult, or maybe rededicated your life as an adult, then the people that you used to hang out around with and and you know, maybe live a life that identified uh, with the world and and those type of people, how did they begin to receive you after you said after you proclaim, "Hey, I'm a Christian. I don't do those things anymore." Not in a not in a self righteous way, but just in a, "Hey, you know, you're wasting your time." No, the answer is no, and it's absolutely no. I'm drawing this boundary. You know, it's not going to happen, right? One of those types of conversations, and they began to, you know, oh. oh Oh, you think you're better than us, right? That's persecution for right living, for identifying 
with Christ in your lifestyle. And when that happens, Jesus says that, you know, hey, you're going through the same thing. You know, you you realize that that God, you know, is excited about that because that's exactly what the prophets went through of old. You're in good company. You're in good company when people persecute you for a right lifestyle. Because that's exactly what happened to the prophets. If you go, that's the Old Testament is full of that. It's full of how people who lived in, inappropriately, who worshipped idols and, and such, they identified with, with sin, a worldly lifestyle, and those who identified with a godly lifestyle stood in contrast, and they, they were persecuted. The prophets were persecuted. I mean, we, you know, the story is, is that Jeremiah was saw, you know, they took a saw and cut him in two. We, we see they, they killed a lot of the prophets. Most of them, they killed. And eventually, the greatest prophet of, a, of all, the Savior of the world, the, the Son of God, they crucified on a cross. So this is the company that we that that we're in. We're in, you know, a this great cloud of witnesses. Hebrews calls it a great cloud of witnesses, and and the Hebrew writer says, "So lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares you. Lay that aside and set your mindset." to racing the long-distance race in life. You know, life is a marathon, and, and it's not a sprint. You don't, you don't live a Christian life for three weeks, and then it's all over with. You're going to live it through the duration of your life. It's a lifestyle choice to live for God. You just tell those people you hang out with that you know aren't living for God that you're not going to live that way anymore. And you see how they separate from you and begin to say bad things about you and persecute you. Now, when we say, you know, every time we see this and we say, you know, God is excited, I'm kind of reminded, I have this brother-in-law that when we were younger, you know, he was three years older than me going through high school. And in high school, he was about 6'2 and clumsy as could be. But he didn't stop growing there. He grew to 6'5. And when he was in college playing ball, he was about 280 pounds with about a 34-inch waist. His, his arms were the size of my legs. And... and and Mark had this, you know, big old deep voices, ha, 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 hey, Timmy, you know, and he would talk, you know, when he talked, it, it's like that. And I remember watching him, you know, one of the, he and his dad used to get in a variety of businesses, and he got into this auction business. And, you know, we would, they would sell uh, used, uh, you know, equipment and, you know, like, uh, bulldozers and backhoes and track hoes and all this, you know, trucks, cars and all this. And Mark would be the ring man, right? And Joe would be, his dad Joe would be calling and, and Mark would be sitting there, you know, trying to get a guy to bid. And as soon as that guy bid, Mark yelled out this big and that big deep voice, you know, yeah, you know, and, and he, pumped that arm, and I mean this arm that looked like a man's leg, you know, he pumped that thing, and it was just a sight to behold, and these people just, it, it drove them, you know, it, it was like they had this endorphin, all of a sudden this endorphin shot and, and, and energy, and they just started bid more and more and more, you know, because they were, you know, they got all excited about Mark going, yeah! You know, and that's what I think God does. You know, when God says and sees that we're persecuted for righteousness sake, that blessedness, I, I think, is that 
God going, yeah, that's my boy or that's my girl. You see, we want to identify with the world because we don't want to be rejected with the, by the world. But when we're living and identifying with Christ, the reality is we are going to be rejected by the world. So it's right living. It's the lifestyle that the Bible calls us to. The Ten Commandments are an easy, you know, hey, I'm a truth teller. I'm not a liar. I'm a faithful spouse. I'm not unfaithful. I respect my parents and authority that's over me. Right? I, I don't steal. Uh, you know, what, what does Paul say? Stop stealing, get a job, earn money, and with the extra, be benevolent towards others. I'm happy and content with what I have. You know, those, those are those Ten Commandments, and, and I love the Lord my God with all my soul, with all of my heart, with all of my mind, and with all of my strength, which basically wraps up the first uh, four of them right there. You see, that's who God wants us to be. And when we live like that, we stand in contrast to the world. So our righteousness is that, that, that we get persecuted for is a righteous lifestyle. The second thing we get persecuted for is righteousness in action. Righteousness in action. You know, the early church was identified as those people who used to go out and get the babies who were abandoned. You know, this is one of the things the early church was identified as, as these throwaway babies the, the Christians would go out and get those babies and take them in. Now, I want to tell you, you know, just like if you go to China today, right, if the child, you know, they're, they're only allowed like one or two children, and if they don't have a male child and it's a little girl, a lot of times they'll cast that, that child out. It's illegal for them to do that, but they do it because it... It brings honor onto the man of the house if he has a male child. So, so these little girls then are, are taken in in China. They're taken into orphanages. That same mindset existed amongst the Romans and amongst a lot of you know the people and the Greeks and stuff. It, they weren't limited, but what they wanted were male children. They wanted heirs. And, and, and the males were the heirs of, you know, of their possessions and stuff. Unfortunately, the world view had a low view of women, right? That was a discussion that we had last night about how the world views women and, uh, and the low view. And I said, hey, if you think God looks at women that way, just read Proverbs 31. I mean, that's a, that's, Anybody would be awesome that could live up to Proverbs 31, right? And if you've not read it, take the time. But this is a businesswoman. This is a this is a woman that has uh, done all these. You know, she makes sure her family's fed. She has servants. She she takes care of her servants. She's a benevolent manager, and and she she treats all of her possessions uh, in a business sense and in a smart business sense, and so on. But, but the things that we see is that little girls were rejected, and oftentimes they would take people, bad people would come and turn them into prostitutes, or others would come and break their arms and legs and turn them into beggars. So the Christians would go out and rescue these children and raise them up as their own so that because they see God has a high value on human life and God wants us to protect children. This, this is an example of the church back, you know, in the, the early stages of the church. And here today, right, we, we ought to have a high view 
of humanity. You know, those people that are screaming, those women that are screaming, my body, my choice, my body, my choice, my body, my choice, need Jesus. The heroin addicts need Jesus. The crack addicts need Jesus. The alcoholics need Jesus. The pedophiles need Jesus. Boy, that's a hard one to say amen to. The whole world needs Jesus. There are those that are amongst us that, you know, we could take like, I love the fact that we're able to work with the school and do, you know, clothes and stuff for families in Bland, for families in need in Bland. I love that. And we help and, and, and we encourage those kids because they get something, right? They get food for the whole time. The goal is to provide the whole families food for the entire time that, that they're off. And it's not always someone who's dirt poor that we need to help. It's the brokenhearted, the people going through tragedies in life, whatever that tragedy may be. Christians ought to know how to love because we've been loved so greatly by God. And we ought to know how to share that. I mean, Paul lays, us, lays it out for us in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is kind. It's patient. It's long-suffering. It's not rude. It does not seek its own. Boy, I want to tell you, everything the world tells us is it's all about me, 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 me. Jesus says, or, or actually Paul says, look at others higher than yourself. Consider others higher than yourself. We're not wired that way. We're not wired. Our actions need to reflect the actions of Christ. Jesus gained nothing when he died on the cross for us. It didn't make him a better God it didn't make his love any better. It was just an avenue for him to express his love towards us because he loved us so much, even when we were standing there with our fist balled and we were screaming, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. In his dying words, he had enough love to say father forgive them for they know not what they do our actions need to go so much deeper than us just providing some clothes and food for the plan families in need or us throwing money in for Lottie Moon and Annie Armstrong. We have to really love people regardless, regardless of how they respond. We have to really start taking a Jesus view towards people. That righteousness in action will result in us being persecuted. And then there's righteousness in speech, in our speech. You know, I mean, it's an easy thing, right? If someone won the lottery, you know, if, if one of y'all was to get a text right now and said, you just... You know, and it was a legitimate text that you just won one billion dollars. You could not contain yourself. You would jump up right now 
and skip around this place and you know <clears throat> your body would be going crazy and everything else you would be so ecstatic and 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 maybe not everybody but i'm saying in general you know that's probably most of us but how easy we forget what christ did for us how easy we forget christ died on the cross so we would not spend eternity in hell. And if he had not done that, there is no other way. There would have been no way for us to go to heaven. Our only way to heaven, the only way for any human being to get to heaven is through the cross of Jesus Christ. And this is the problem that we have. And, and, and it's a real problem. We don't think sin's that bad. So we don't think we really deserve death and hell. I mean, let's be honest. But that's what God says. God says, because of your sin, you say, man, I'm a pretty good person. No, not in God's eyes. In the men's Bible study today, Noah had come out of the boat and brought all the uh, the animals and everything out of the boat, out of the ark, and he and he made an offering. And the, the you know God says, "I will never do this again. Judge the world and all creation with, by floodwaters again." And he says, "Yet man's heart is still only continuously on evil," and he had. Just rescue humanity through six people. And just in those six, even in those moments, he said, this is still a broken world. None of us outside of Christ do good. What we've received if you don't comprehend it, then you need to get in the Word of God and you need to pray that God would reveal what your situation was. Right? If you're a Christian. If you don't comprehend it, then you need to ask God to help you understand. Because I want to tell you, when you realize that, I don't care if it's a billion dollars or ten billion dollars. There's nothing like salvation. The only thing that we ought to be rejoicing, or, or not the only thing, but the thing that we ought to be rejoicing for over everything else is the fact that God has saved us. And it ought to pour out of our mouths. We're so worried about how it's going to make if I talk about Jesus, I'm worried about how it's going to make me look. Why? You think he was worried how he looked when he was hanging on the cross? With his flesh barely hanging on to his bones? He was despised and rejected. And that's exactly what a Christian will experience from the world if they're leaving a righteous life. If you're persecuted for righteousness, man, you're making God pray. He still loves you no matter what. But man, how do I do it? I'm poor in spirit. I mourn and grieve. I have a broken and contrite heart. I'm, I'm meek. I know I can't save myself or I can't fix myself. That God has to fix me. I, I want to be rightly related to God. I, I hunger and thirst for right relationship with Him. I'm, I'm looking to be merciful and show people mercy because of the great mercy God has shown me. I'm looking to be pure and singly devoted to God in my life and I'm looking to uh, 
to be a peacemaker and and remove the strife and contention that exists not only between me and other people, but in the area that I'm exposed to. And when I do all of those things, I realize I will be persecuted. I'm going to hear, oh, or you're going to hear, oh, there's that Christian. There's Mr. or Miss Goody Two-Shoes. And when that happens, God's up there going, yeah! Because what Paul says is that's a testimony against them. They're going to remember that one day. And, and if it doesn't work to convert their lives, it's going to be played back for them on Judgment Day. Remember that show, This Is Your Life? <laughs> That's what's going to happen. Now, maybe you're, all, maybe you're a person that don't have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and I want to tell you, I want to invite you to do that. The Bible says all we have to do is stop running from God and turn to God in faith, receiving Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we put a prayer up there just to guide you. It, it doesn't mean that these are magical words. It's just a way to help you form the words and the thoughts and intents of your heart. And, and there's, again, nothing magical about that. So if you want to get saved, we, we ask you to pray, whether it's your own prayer or if you want to use that one. And we'll invite you to come down and make that public. Right? There's no sense in, in being a closet Christian. It doesn't even make sense. If you're a believer and you said, you know what? People would be shocked to find out I'm a Christian. Then you need to rededicate your life. Right? You need to get back to that point where you were excited. Remember the day that you were saved. Man, how excited were you? How thankful were you? Ask God to provide that tenderness in your heart again that, that you experienced at that time. I'm going to ask you to stand and we're going to have a word of prayer and then we'll have this hymn of invitation. Let us pray.